Hello and welcome to Wargamer Online and today we have, uh, well, much thanks to Games Workshop, uh, a copy of Kragnos to have a look at. Broken Realms Kragnos. Fully it, should be, it should be uh, mentioned this is the last instalment of the Broken Realms Last well. instalment, indeed. The pinnacle? No, not the pinnacle, that's the best. I think we're rambling before the <laughs> intro. Let's get into it. This video is made possible by our patrons. Here we go then, here it is. This is Kragnos. So this is part four of the Broken Realm series. Um, there we are, Marathi, Teclas, Bellacor, Kragnos. Same size. I do like all the different colors on the side. Very nice it's set, very fun. nice set of books to have and I'm really pleased to have them. So talking about being pleased to have them, of course we do need to state Big thank you to Games Workshop. We nearly yes. said it in the intro, but here we are. Um, thanks views. to the wonderful uh, team at GW who sent us along a longer review copy. Uh, we're super pleased to receive this. Yep. Um, but before we go anywhere, let's have a talk about what we're going to be doing. Yeah, I mean, we only, yeah, I've been um, um, speed reading this to try and understand all the lore, let's say, because there's a lot of it. And. Um, this is kind of, because I wasn't finding the word for it, I'm going to use the word that you've taught me, the ultimate um, kind of book in AOS 2. It's kind of, this is what is bringing Age of Sigmar 2 to a close. The, the Necroquake has subsided, Kragnos has awakened from the mountain, there's a new power in play in the mortal realms, and you're going in to kind of, Something new, something more destruction-y and beasty in uh, AOS 3. I, I think it's fair to say uh, it's no secret um, Age of Sigmar 3, right around yes, the corner. Yes, yeah. Um, and as you said, this is this has been the campaign that's brought about the end of the Souls. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's brought a close to AOS 2, and I have thoroughly enjoyed the series. I think it has been really good. The stories, kind of the, the interventions of the gods and reading the lore on this... It again lives up to the expectations. The uh, the law writers and, to be honest, the artists as well have really done a tremendous job mm. with this book. Well, what we're going to do, we're going to jump into the book. And uh, why have we talked about the book to start with? Because what we're going to do is, for those of you who don't want any kind of spoilers whatsoever on the story, and we're not going to give it all away, yep. but we're going to discuss some of the key events that are covered in the book. If you don't want to see that, check the link below, um, and if possible, we'll flag it up on screen, yeah, maybe. Timestamp. A timestamp of where you need to zoom to to get to, to get just the, the description uh, the on rules. the rules. Yes, yeah. So if you don't want to know any law, now's your chance. Click the timestamp, advance, fast forward, whatever it is, to the time you can see in front of your eyes right now, and that will take you into our rule discussion. Do you think they've gone? I think they've gone. I think, I think they've gone. That's enough time for a spoiler alert. So it uh, is, isn't it? So well, there you yeah, go. What we're going to do now is have a quick look at the front section of the book, yeah. and I think it is telling to say what a great series this has been. Is because when this came through, I witnessed you basically pick this book up and start reading it from the front. Yeah, yeah. And I think you know, normally uh, when these things come out, you're straight to the rules. I am. Yeah, <laughs> normally I am, but I I wanted to sink my teeth into the lore of this one because it was. The, the thing about Kragnos which really kind of intrigued me is it's a lot of players which you don't usually hear about mm. from the Mortal Realms. It focuses a lot on Alariel and Destruction, two kind of forces that Alariel hasn't been doing a lot since the Necroquake. No. And Destruction are always kind of like a side character. You know, they they fight a wandering band of Oryx or some cheeky grots yeah, on the road, I, I but think it's... never is there kind of this amassed, organised force. Well, let's let's talk about the two contesting factors of each version. When when Age of Sigmar 1 came out, it was the Realm Gate Wars, and that so was very much st order, and with a particular cast. focus on Stormcast. Yeah. Versus, versus chaos. chaos, yeah. Then we move into the necro cake, where it's basically been death, death versus more or less everything, but predominantly different factions of order. Of, yeah, of order. There's been some kind of chaos. Few You've kind of, of had a bit of scuffles, kind of towards the end of AOS two, because you know the like ninety percent of AOS two has been the necro quake. The last ten percent have been the broken realm saga, which yeah. is kind of them dismantling the necro quake and moving into AOS. 
which is going to be who knows? Who knows? I mean, who that's knows? the interesting thing. Um, Broken Realms is a title. It kind of almost feels like that could be the underpinning title to the series. Yeah, yeah. Whether but whether the Broken it, Realms is actually going to move through to AI you know, three? Uh, we certainly feel with the introduction of Kragnos that destruction is now going to come to the fore. Maybe definitely. Uh, given what happened between Teclas and Nagash, spoilers. Yeah, um, I, I think Death will be taking a little bit of a backseat, but they're still involved in some heavy duty stuff, aren't they? You know, they're yeah. in the eight points. There's a whole bunch of story that still can be expanded out. Yeah, there. definitely. Let's start talking about the book, though. Um, we've got some key sections in here: Act One in Excelsis, Act Two, the Rampage of Kragnos, yeah, uh, the Siege of Excelsis. Excelsis. So and then we're into the rules. So three three key stories here. Yeah, and everything kind of takes point around um, the city of Excelsis, which is a a human settlement within Gur, the, the 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 realm of beasts. And this is kind of where it takes a lot of um, a lot of the story revolves around. But you do have bits like this beginning bit, um, which is all about Alariel, and it's kind of about how. Because of the diminishing death magics and the reduction of the Necroquake that Teclas has brought around with defeating Nagash, um, the resurgence of life has beginning to spread throughout her realm. And it was one of those things they never really talked about, but the Necroquake had a really bad impact on Alario, you know, death magics permeating the realm. Um, so this starts off with Alario marching with Drycher and a whole glade of Sylvaneth to the desiccated corpse of the Oak of Ages. Mm. And she kind of lines up around it. She begins to sing this beautiful song. And there's like beast men throwing themselves at her as she begins this song. And it heals the Oak of Ages. This kind of great tree, for, for lack of a better word. And the tree begins to bear fruits and the fruits drop off. And from it become the, the the first spirits to kind of germinate Gairan. So which, these are like the war song revenants. Which are the war song revenants. Yeah, they come from these seeds and play their beautiful melodies. And she sends the war song revenants off into the realms to spread life again. So where they go and where they play their song, the 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 life's magic begin to permeate the realms. Wicked, but as anything with this. Yeah. Um, uh, interesting, by the way, these uh, these uh, cave drawings. Amazing. I know from Scrag Scrag Rock. Scrag Rock kind of talks actually about refers it, the to these cave yes. cave stories, yeah. doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I I love it. Yeah, it does it does tell the story of Kragnos kind of becoming who he is, getting his mace and his shield, fighting the children of Dracothian, and then finally being entombed in the mountain. In the mountain, yeah. And you kind of I I really like how they've done it as cave drinks, because of course this all happened in the age of myth before kind of a lot of the gods even existed. Yeah. So, of course, it would be kind of the very primitive creatures. And there was an interesting point, wasn't there, that you were reading, because obviously there's been a lot of commentary about how he looks like a beastman, of course. And you were kind For of saying there's, 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 there's an inference he is a beastman. He is a beastman. He were, because he was one of the first races, and the beastmen were one of the first races, they kind of they share an ilk in yeah. which they were kind of this this split between animals and humans and whilst the beastmen because the beastmen of course weren't originally creatures of chaos they were creatures of order but um, when humans came and began to call their herds because they saw because whilst it were creatures of order they were a bit kind of way drunken bravado and all that mm. they turned to chaos as kind of their saviors and that's when you get the beasts of chaos. but of course Kragnos missed all of that because he was uh, asleep he was inside a mountain tombed in a mountain and his entire race dead so he's come out and he's kind of really destruction you know uh, yeah I mean it's interesting because obviously one of his first ambitions when he escapes from the mountain of course is to find his own people. Yes. You know, he wants to unite his people and find his people, and of course, time has moved on. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we're, we're fast forwarding a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, so this is the first act, which is kind of about Excelsius, and it's getting the um, getting the scene for this. I mean, you have this beautiful artwork of the, the Zechians. Fantastic. This change storm that's erupting. The idea of Zech in combat where you've just got all this insane yeah. amount of magic just ripping yeah. across the battlefield is brilliant. So this kind of talks about how if anybody doesn't know, Excelsius 
has this really cool story to it in which the city is kind of built around this shard of some sort of god beast or weapon they're not quite sure this silver shard and you can hack pieces off it and you can kind of use this silver this whatever this silver is and it gives you premonitions and foresight right and that's how excelsius has kind of earned its keep um, but a long ago, the Zichians kind of, you know, change and foresight and magic was attracted to this, so attacked it. And this happened long ago, they managed to repel it, but a lot of the city has to be cordoned off and quarantined, because there's still all these living magics which torrent through the city, so vast areas of Excelsius is um, shut off, because you have all these Zichian firestorms which kind of rupture through. Um... It then kind of talks about how Excelsius has this kind of weird civil uprising cult, in which case there are a bunch of kind of Sigmarite flagellants that see magics to be evil because magics are what caused all this to begin with. So they begin um, assassinating majors, assassinating elves especially within the city, and he kind of creates this weird um, cult in the, the middle of the quarantine zone. And he bans all mirrors because he sees mirrors to be a doorway to the kind of the unknown. And he creates this hallway of mirrors where he tortures elves and makes them look at each other. It's quite, it's quite horrible. Um, but whilst this is happening, the new Slaneshi twins are born. Ah, uh, okay. The voice okay. and the talent who are kind of talked about as being Marathi's children because they were born of Marathi and Slanesh when she extracted the souls. How weird. So is this this from a from a dark unholy Holy union? union. Yeah, 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 and you get this kind of, you know, the really cool artwork with the cool peacock wings and the eyes. Uh, uh, I have noticed as I've been flipping through this, as you're kind of, I'm tracking as you're telling the story of what's covered. There is, uh, of course, uh, you know, they're bringing in the, the witch finders, yeah? Yeah, so the, the witch, part. the father and daughter kind of come in to see what's going off. There is a Skaven assault as well, which right. they, ha ha they help out in, but it <laughs> kind of gets... Um, destroyed, so but a, a lot of the Skaven kind of scatter into the shadows right, and okay. stuff That's like that. Skaven. And then these kind of unholy, this duality, these twins are born and they begin to amass power and they begin to use the mirrors of this cult to kind of spy because, you know, they're almost a cult of excess. So they begin spying and kind of planning on what they're going and to do. And this is, because this starts off in Ooglu, yeah? Yes. Ooglu, yeah. rather, Ooglu. Um, is where it starts off. Is, is this then, is this the shard of um, of Slanesh that kind of shot across the sky uh, yes. at the end of the Marathi? Yeah, yeah, so when she extracted the soul, she left a bit of herself in there. Um, and you see this kind of, screaming soul thing streak across the sky and it does talk about how originally it was one creature this amorphous blob of magic but when mm. it began to coalesce it split into these two creatures the voice and the talon light and dark they were kind of solar opposites of each other but also intertwined much yeah, like Marathi and Slanesh and, and Ugo, Olgu and Haish of course yeah. um, you know that kind of paradox of the two existing side by side yeah Re really cool kind of you know they, they play like Games Workshop and Age of Sigmar play a lot with these kind of two opposites and you know they've done it again and I think it's really cool being children born from both the birth of a god and the undying hatred between Marathi and their godly ne uh, nemesis uh, the creatures were not only a dark beauty, but also deep and, uh, and uh, indelible with self loathing yeah. So, yeah, yeah, interesting. They've got this they, kind they, of duality they, to they them. They hate yeah. themselves because they are offsprings of Marath. So that sets the scene, if you like, that sets the for scene what's of going off of Excelsis. That's the... <laughs> yeah, you have this kind of cult, and then you have the Slanesh kind of infiltrating the cult, then you have the destruction wrought upon by the Skaven. And also, because the cults are targeting elves, a lot of the elves kind of leave, and they go, nah, I don't want anything to do with this, because right. I'm being targeted, and they kind of leave. Okay. Right, as we move from there, though, we then take this jump across, if you like, to um, the, the rampage of Kragna. So we move away from Excelsis. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I mean, it's kind of based around the same 
place. It's a lot of the kind of the same area. Yeah, we're in we're in Gur. Yeah, you're we're in, in Gur, the same area, but this, in terms of the in terms of the Tusk, story narrative, we so move it's this Tusculan it. coast. And Excelsius is here on the map. Excelsius, yeah, Excelsius, and, uh, and I'm not quite sure where Kragnos awakes, but he kind of walks around a lot of it. Trumpety, yeah. trumpety, trumpety. I think we just backtrack the arrow, don't we? Of oh, Broken yeah, Realms there you go. Kragnos' rampage <laughs> begins at... There you go. Yeah, you're right. Like, you can see where the entire <laughs> realm's being he cracked cracks, apart. Because he cracks the island into two, yeah. doesn't he? Or the, the realm into two as he runs along, basically. Yeah. Wow. Nuts. Um, backdrop to Kragnos, then. Yeah. I think we kind of covered it in the cave painting. But... Yeah, and a lot of... I think they've kind of talked about this. You know, he was... A creature of an old race who broke away from that race searching for power and gained a following with the orcs and um, gained more and more power because the orcs gave him kind of realm stone and marrow from beasts and he gained this power until eventually he took on like the, dra the, the dragons, the dracoths mm. who enlisted Croak to help them save them from extinction and Croak bound him in a prison in the mountain. It is interesting, though, because that, that point you made, and uh, I just want to jump into this, it, it basically says, you know, before men came along, before elves came along, that the realms were inherent, inhabited by these hybrid creatures. Mm -hmm. You know, as much animal as sentient men, many of these were the spawn of primordial essence of chaos. Yeah. That's the whole thing. They came about because of the essence of chaos, but they weren't the they deities. Weren't, they weren't chaos. They, they didn't weren't, worship they chaos. They didn't worship yeah. chaos. They were just a almost, just as order can create, so it can create chaos. Yes. You know, it's yeah. not. So they were almost unaffiliated. They weren't, they weren't evil point. creatures. They weren't creatures of kind of madness and deceit like chaos. Is they didn't worship the pantheon because chaos itself became formed by the emotions and and motivations of, yeah. of individual races. Really, women. the beastmen are the original children of chaos, and that's the thing. They they kind of because of their outcast by humans and elves, they kind of formed the chaos pantheon and gave it power again. It says. I mean, it also says there were also races whose existence was pure and free of unnatural taint. That was his uh, that's his, his, his race. Yeah, they yeah, they yeah. were a harmonious race, but he kind of strayed away from it. So yeah, okay. I mean, there's a lot more in it, kind of about the relationships between him and the Dracos and how he got his weapons and stuff, which is really cool. Um, but I won't go into it too much because <laughs> you know you can talk for hours about it. Um, then it kind of follows him waking up. So Alariel's song penetrates the land. It causes trees to dig deep and break his prison. Um, and he basically gets his mace whilst underground and beats his way out of a mountain, just destroys the As mountain. You do. Yeah. Um, and that's what a lot of the kind of the Broken Realms fiction that they've been releasing, a lot of the short stories, um, kind of Scragrot and Gordrak, they've been hearing this thump, thump thump in their head Deep constantly. Noise. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. him bashing against the mountain. It's really cool. Um, so, Kragnos breaks out of the mountain, goes, whoa, what's all this going off? Where's my people? And he basically just charges across the realm. He goes, rah! And just goes across the realm. And you it kind of hear about him. He realises his race is dead, and he sees a city of humans here, and he's like, oh, I don't want them here. They're claiming my land. I'm going to go get them. So he kind of charges towards the human cities, and on his way, he um, encounters some giants, and he kills a bunch of giants, and then some of the giants join him because they're smart giants. They just recognize Very much kind of strength and power, this you know? destruction esque yeah. feel. Um, and then you have. Well, he is a god. I mean, yeah, they, yeah, they, they sense is, that. Yeah, yeah, they sense they? he is a god of pure destruction. Um, and then from there, you get kind of a bit about Scragrot and Gordrak, who are formed an alliance, uh, and it's brilliant. Kind of orcs and grots, I could listen to them talking to each other all day. Um, and, and really Scrag good. Scragrot, the absolute manipulator of oh, all the events, absolute of course, genius. Is completely that he trying is. to manipulate yeah, Gordrak, yeah. but Gordrak, in his in his own essence, is prone to uh, resist him just simply through his own stupidity. Yeah, yeah, because it's just really stupid. <laughs> you can't really plan to guide uh, a great orc. big R at Warbox, yeah. you know. You kind of just have to prod him yeah. in the right direction and hope he doesn't notice you prodding him. Yeah, and I noticed that <laughs> Scragnock keeps a healthy distance from Gordrak yeah. whilst doing all of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. keeps Sending very healthy subordinates distance. to go deal with it. <laughs> um, so there is a very funny outtake about a cave shaman talking to Gordrak. Um, they're kind of on this path to collect a bunch of relics. 
But as they do so, they see Kragnos kind of stampeding across the realm. Gordrak comes up with his army of orcs, looks and goes, yeah, I'm going to go kill that. And he goes after Kragnos. And there's an uh, incredible battle, isn't there? I mean, yeah, there's this amazing battle between Kragnos and Gordrak. I won't kind of tell you how it goes, but it's really good. You well, can it, kind of guess how I mean, it goes. Well, you can kind of, he's a god, yeah? yeah? Kragnos is a god. He's a god. Yeah? Yeah, but, but Gordrak is also the right-hand <laughs> man of he Gore. He completely brings it, doesn't oh, yeah. he? And um, um, Big Tooth is brilliant. <laughs> oh, yeah, Big Tooth. Yeah, Big involved. Tooth. He's just like, um, he's basically like a pit bull Rottweiler just just latches on and doesn't let go. So yeah, Gordrak in no means is is kind of like subservient to uh, no. to Kragnos really. He, at all, of, he gets he, no, he, he has a go at him, um, <laughs> and he actually him. does he pretty does good go. <laughs> um, and it's actually and kind of through a bunch of actions, it ends up getting bra- broken up. And because they can't talk to each other, of course, because he's this ancient god, and you know Gordrak can barely form sentences. Um, Kragnos basically points at the human city and starts marching and Gortrak goes, oh come on lads we're following this guy. I think he says something like, you word him lads. <laughs> yeah let's get to smashing. <laughs> and he just goes off and follows Kragnos. Which is just um, absolutely you know, I'm amazing. Just tilting it up yeah. so you don't get shine on the artwork there but it's an absolutely beautiful photo of this big battle between these two guys. Yeah. Where's Kragrock? Because he should be hiding somewhere uh, up on a mountainside, according to the way the um, story is. Not... There, look. There he is. He is yeah, kind of. Yeah, he kind of sits. Which, back. which he consoles himself. It's not that he doesn't want to be down there in all it's the a action. Tactical, tactical. He, he advantage. does it for a tactical advantage, so yeah. he can see the battlefield from yeah. above. Yeah, it's nothing to do with the fact he recognizes that Kragnos <laughs> is a god of destruction. Yeah, and Gordrak, you don't want to get close to him when he's angry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, nothing to do with either of those two. Yes. Yeah, so, so you get this kind of amassing of a massive war with squigs and trogs and giants and orcs and all sorts and it's just amazing this kind of menagerie of destruction brilliant it's really good really good to kind of hear about the uh the the destruction side of it only line. There he is, Big Chief. Get him. <laughs> yeah, there he is, Big Chief. Get him. <laughs> More Christian goes on. Both. So uh, they um, form a rather weird alliance of convenience. Yeah, as much I, as anything. alliance. Of and in, they're both impressed with each other. Yeah, I think this, that's the thing. Yeah. Kragnos kind of sees this orc who he thinks he's just going to squat, and this orc actually does pretty good against him. And he's knocks like, a few of his teeth out for sure. <laughs> you know what? I can use him. And Gordrak goes. I'm not going to say how, but actually, because his tongue. Right? Yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> um, and Gordrak kind of and um, Gordrak goes, "Yeah, all right, he'll smash some stuff. He's good to follow for a smashing." So he kind of follows him. Yeah, and they do kind um, of explain it only with a bit of an uh, orc philosophy quote, which is like, you know, if you find something big and bad at smashing stuff that's probably worth following norm- they normally are good at finding smashers <laughs> and like things to smash so says so you can follow you can follow cunning for so long but yeah, at the end of the day, end of brutal brutal <laughs> it always ro- revolves something getting hit um, so we turn our attention to the final chapter of the story if you like which yes. is the uh, siege of excelsis yeah, so this is when finally the armies of destruction, the army of Kragnos, comes to lay siege to Excelsius. And it had a very much a Battle of Pelennor feels to it. When I was reading it, I couldn't help imagine it because you've kind of got this last shining bastion of mankind, then you've got this unending tithe of orcs with huge mega gargants in it and stuff like that. And, you, you know, you've got cannons and Hellblaster volley guns which are shooting and then you've got, like, more crushers and giants throwing rocks. It's brilliant. It's how Age of Sigmar is meant to be. But we've got a top of the Serpentis Embassy, Lord Croak Wielders. <laughs> so, so who are the <laughs> factions of order wading in at this stage? So um, got... Pretty much everybody. Pretty much everybody. <laughs> Like, without getting too much away, you do have Stormcast and humans and the witch hunters, lizard men, um, some unlikely allies come in right at the end, who I won't kind of say who that is, but it is it's a cool little bit at the end. Um so whilst the orcs are invading, you have like the Slaneshi uprising as well, so they get attacked on two fronts and they have to uh, kind of split, and it kind of swings them round about. I did wonder really where the Slaneshi good. come in. So there is yeah. an uprising led by the twins, yeah? Mm-hmm. The voice and the talent. 
Um, interesting stuff. So yeah, it's very good, and I think it is kind of self-explanatory. This, but you know, there's so much that goes off in this, but it's the siege. Yeah. And inevitably, it all gets decided here. Right. Okay. And I'm going to stop showing pages because I don't want to give away the end of the siege. But um, it looks pretty damn epic. Um, we are left at the end with what? Almost um, like a recap? Kind um, of a recap of each of the four players. So Bellacor, Teclas, again with their amazing artworks. That uh, beautiful. The Merapi and Kragnos, yeah. yeah. So that, that kind of, which of course is the four books that yes. formed part of this rather wonderful series. Um, and then, you know, ultimately takes us into an artwork section. Let's have a quick look at this. We get a sense of the model. Super nice. It's a great that model. I'd awesome. like to. Yeah, I think if I get hold of a copy of him, I definitely want to do more with tone. this coloring, yeah. like jewel tone from you know top to bottom. But um, just because it's such a big model, I feel like I could probably you could do more with that color scheme, couldn't you? The twins are insane. Just Beautiful. insane bits yeah. of modeling. Um, if I was a dark Eldar player right now, I'd be so happy <laughs> about these things for vehicle conversions. Mm. But that's another story. Um, and of course, we have the uh, War Song Revenant. Yep. Uh, great looking model. I'm happy with it. Silver Neff player. I'm happy to see a new I, model. I I do like this kind of this aesthetic of half spirit, half tree type. Yeah, thing. kind it's of really floaty, cool. cloaky bit and life All the sort of and the eggs. Of up. course, the witch vine is very two just very cool looking yeah. models. Let's face it. Uh, and then we've got Uber Croak. Uber Croak on his yeah, Uber chair. Yeah. Croak 2.0. Super nice. Uh, I Croak. Um, <laughs> I croak X. I croak X Pro. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I croak X Pro. That's yeah, what it yeah, is. Just... With his random little skink dude with a spear. Meh. Meh. Take a Meh. spear, dude. Um, and then we're into the rules. So here we yes. are. Yes. Here we okay. go. Right. So here we go. For those of you who have fast forwarded, we've landed at the rules. We've had a nice chat about the first <laughs> section of the book. How far through are they? Yeah, a good halfway through the book. This is there what, is a yeah. section of the rules. Which we're probably not going to cover today. They're it's about the other missions, and it's the campaign. And we're not going to cover this too much. Except to say, we're going to try and play the campaign from front to back as part of a channel thing. Um, and we know that, you know, Age of Sigmar 3 is just around the corner, but we're going to try and um, pay homage to this um, narrative series. and play some, of these, uh, play some of these missions. But that's for another day. This takes us, of course, into the Battle Tome updates. Yes. Battle Tome updates covering the introduction of Kragnos, the Gloom Spike Gits, Sylvan F, woo! Uh, <laughs> Head Knights of Slanesh, Cities of Sigmar, Seraphont, Skaven, Beasts of Chaos, um, and then, of course, the, 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 the points. points into it. What do we want to do? Do Can we do this ba -ba. without talking about the boy? Ba -ba, da boy, Kragnos, the end of empires. The monster killer. 36 oh, mortal he's wounds. He's coming! 36 mortal wounds, I think, is what he does. Oh, <laughs> he's coming! Like that. It's, it's horrific. He's a fine chunk. Um, <sighs> let's just have a look at that then. So, oh, 15 mortal wounds. Yeah, 15 mortal wounds. Because uh, that is an 8, of course. Yes. You have to roll a 7 for it not to work. What am I talking about? Well, oh, there's the 7. 7, so there's it nothing. Doesn't, doesn't do anything. And there's that's, a 6. So, nine uh, 3 times 3, wounds. 9 mortal wounds. Yeah. Um, the 36 is the possibility, but, you know, I've just done 3 and 6, 18 so 18 mortal, mortal wounds. What are we talking about? We are talking about um, the the rampage. Is it the rampage of destruction rule? It is indeed, yeah. isn't it? But before we do that, let's jump back a little bit, because we got excited about yeah. that. 18 wounds. 18 wounds on a uh, Variable move from 10. On a flat 2 plus armor save. Flat 2 plus armor save. 6 attacks, minus 3 rend, 4 damage. 3 yep. attacks. 3 inch range, by the way. Let's <laughs> not forget that. Let's not forget that, because it makes a difference. Uh, too sweet. Tusk Breaker, which is the shield. Yeah. 3 attacks. Minus, minus 2, two rend. And then, and then the Hooves of Rack and Ruin, attacks, which starts off three, at 6. 2 is minus 1, 2 damage. Um, and, of course, at 18 wounds, you need to do 9 wounds on him before you even start to chip him down. Yeah. On a 2 up save. Yeah, he's um, he's a he's, in, he's interesting. But he's a Gordrak. Uh, no, sorry, not a Gordrak. A Gotrak. Um, he doesn't have any keywords. He can't benefit from army allegiance abilities. But he's a one-man army. In which case, if you get him in against what you want to get him in against, he'll delete. He will delete. Like it. you know, there's no stopping him. 
he's a two plus save. The only letdown is he doesn't have an ignore. So when we look at the meta, um, he will struggle against Lumineth, uh, like Sentinel spam, Daughters of Cain, mortal, Kane, wounds. mortal kind wounds of at range. ranged mortal wounds. Yeah, because um, he's quick, but he's not super quick, and he doesn't have fly with a big doesn't base. It's easy to get kind of bogged down. But if you can bounce him. From unit to unit every turn, he will make his points because he will pick a unit and delete it. I think it's one of those things that you look at it and he looks terrifying. And then you realise there's a whole bunch of armies that would be a hard counter to him. Yes, there there, there is. And then for, from a tournament scene, from a gaming scene, it'd be really tricky to take Kragnos. Because you're going to encounter one of those hard counters. Yeah, but but um, I mean, hey, you're also a, saying this as him as a standalone model. You have to remember, like, you can put him in a big war army and <laughs> back yeah. him up with 30 arrow boys, who, if you get the first drop, which you probably will because, you know, low drops with such a big model, those 30 arrow boys can deal with any ranged mortal wounds. But he is what he have. is. is a 700 plus point of sheer uh, combat uh, destruction. Death star. Yeah, 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 you know what I mean, and you have to recognize that Death Stars are, by their very nature, extremely scary. Yes, but you know, there's always that little pipe you can pop a torpedo down. <laughs> yeah, um, and and that's where and and his his weakness is, you know, mortal wounds at range. Exactly. Um, you know, because there are plenty of units out there that can do double figure mortal wounds. In at a range. single round, yeah. at range, yeah, like you know, twenty uh, sentinels. And suddenly, whatnot. he starts to, you know, starts to go down, but still impressive. I'm not going to deny his impressive. Oh, he is. I am not good. going to deny his strong, but I'm also uh, going to openly admit that I think there are ways of dealing with him. Yes, as yeah. there should be. Yeah, as there yeah, should definitely. Be. I mean, he has this whole thing like his bellow of rage, where he will do mortal wounds to your own units, which is quite funny. He just rolls and people die. Um, he can destroy terrain, which is quite cool. Yeah. Um, he's got. He really doesn't like dragons, so he gets like reroll charge and Star hits. Drake, Drake's Dracoff, Dracolines. Yeah. So if you're fighting Stormcast, that's a really interesting thing to introduce, isn't it? You know, right at the tail end specific. of Age of Sigma two. Something really specific about Star Drakes, Drakes, Dracos, and, I mean, and Dracolines. We know, we know. There's new Stormcast coming. We've seen new Stormcast. Is there going to be new Dragon Riders? Would be well, cool. It's, it's just, you, you, yeah, you Would just, be it's cool. just a really interesting thing to creep in right at the end. Yeah. Of, oh yeah, do you remember those units? Hardly anybody's been playing. Well, this guy's a hard counter to them, and you yeah. go, what? <laughs> no, I wonder why. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. He, um, he has his rampaging destruction, so he does like d6 mortal wounds to a unit if he charges them, which is pretty good. But then if he charges a monster, he does the 2d6 times together number of mortal wounds, but if you roll a 7, nothing happens. Yeah. So that is the thing, and and that's one of the things. If you're kind of running, you know, if you run um, Melkor, Teclas, um, Archeon, any of the big gods, Nagash, anything like that... He's going to be extremely terrifying against that because he could just do it in one charge. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he could he could slam into Teclas and do thirty six mortal wounds, and that's it. Yeah, bang. What are you gonna do? And um, you know, and Alariel's got a new war scroll, but she's still got no form of mortal wound no, at all. So one no. just slam into Alariel, and you would just yeah, pop exactly. Off the table. Bam, bam, she's gone. Now, of particularly course, if you're attacking first, and if you've got the charge, then you're attacking but first. But this is the thing: he he is a big base without fly, and there is no way of giving him fly. You know, Sylvan F tactics would be, as we're going to see later, the new tree rules. Um, you can zone him in, stop him from even being able to move. If you can put like trees like that, uh, you know, and he's behind it, you know, like the warp lightning vortex, and he just can't move through them, and you just sit back and go. Um, there, so there are ways to deal well, with it. A, I mean, even screening with a ten-inch move is not is not is quick, but is not fast enough to just ignore screens, and that's the whole thing. Yeah. So that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to need to screen. He's less effective against small units. Yeah. He's going to kill them. Yeah, definitely in combat, but he doesn't get the charge bonusy thing, does he? Yeah, that's... and kind of on the flip side is that. As his player, your opponent's going to be so fixated on dealing with him because they have to yeah. that suddenly you you're, you've got the rest of, of your army to try and do things. You know, the difference between him and Gotrek is he moves 10 and Gotrek doesn't. 
Great yeah. Trek moves four and he can't move fast so enough. This guy much, can run. Yeah, yeah. So like with Go Trek, your opponent puts him down and he goes, oh, all right, I don't really care. Yeah, I can you're just avoid a, if you're a quick those. enough... Yeah, yeah, yeah I can just avoid him for the rest of the game without much detriment to my army. Whereas this guy's fast enough to be a threat. Yeah. Um... He gets his ability to just ignore spells, which they might as well change that to ignore spells because. So each turn this ball is affected six. by a spell or ender spell. You can roll 3d6. The roll is greater than the casting value of the spell or ender spell. Ignore the effects. You know what, though? You say that, but of course, Teclis can pump out four spells on a 10. It doesn't matter. It's the casting value, not the casting roll. So it's oh, the actual spell's it's casting the actual value. Spell yeah. value. Oh. Um, Pinch. So a lot of spells are sixes, sevens, which on three d six is very easy to stop. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Um, so, but Just you know, crackling green lightning off that shield is this exactly. The story. Yeah, no, he's really got. I think he's the fact he can go with any destruction army. It's going to open up a lot of possibilities. I can already see him and just billions upon billions of grots just being an absolute nuisance. Shooters yeah. and boing grots just everywhere, I think would be really funny. Him and orcs, just odd boys in a big war, bone slitters in a big war, something like that would be really cool. Um, he does give plus one bravery to all destruction as well, kind of being an icon of destruction. So I think he's really good. It's nice to see destruction getting some love. It's nice to see destruction having this uniting centerpiece as well. Hmm. So yeah, I really like him. I think he's really good. Um, I think it's going to take a while to for people to develop tactics against him. I think it's going to take a while for people to realize how to well, utilize I mean, him. Well, you, you say that, but of course, again, it's a well-known fact. Age of Sigma three is around the corner. Who, Who knows, knows what's changing? Yeah. Because that puts everything on its head anyway. So a lot of people are going to be having to learn a lot of new stuff. Yeah. Okay. Let's Okay, we're just going to flip through a few sections. The Bad Moon Loon Shrine. This is really the stuff about the git. So, big significant change here. What has this been about? Um, as I kind of so, you've got new allegiance abilities for a Trog Herd, a Spider Herd, and a Squig Herd army. So, those people kind of, you know, one of the complaints about the Gloom Sprite Gits army was, you know, whilst you had all these sub factions all together. They didn't really, you know, a lot of people like to pick one of those factions and do it to a large degree, and they miss out a lot on the allegiance abilities. So this now allows you to do a complete Trogoth army, a complete Spider army, and a complete Squig army. Because essentially you can have a uh, Gloom Spike Gits. Well, yeah, so the there. Loom Shrine used to just bring back Grots and Stabbers. Stabbers but and But now shooters, it yeah. can bring back... Um, if your general has a Squig keyword, you can bring back Squig Hurts. If it's got a Trogoth, you can bring back Trogoths, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, makes sense. Spider Fang can bring back Spider Riders. Yeah. So essentially, they've made the terrain piece universal. Yes. And if yeah. you want to pick a themed Trogoth army, then this works for you. Yeah, yeah and exactly. But so you always get Stabbers and Shooters, but you only get Spider Fang, Squig, and um, it, Trolls if it, your general, general is one of those things. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense. Um, and then they did the kind of the Grim Skull tribes, the, the Squig tribes, and e each one of them has something so you know the the squigs get to re-roll their move the the trolls get better regeneration and the spider fang i think get like better venom um and they each kind of get a command trait and artifact it, it, it's pretty good it's good if you want to run a trog army then it's really which i've good. always wanted to run a trog army yeah. so um maybe that's next um but uh, you know, as a Sylvaneth player, I am keen to take a moment to have a look at Alariel and the Warsong Revenant. Yes. Um, I have to say, and I'm going to say this as a Sylvaneth player, I am less excited about these than I am about what's over the page. Because for me, this book is all about the Wildwoods. Yeah. Um, full stop. I could talk about this rule all day in terms of what it means for a Sylvaneth player. Okay, but before we do that, talk about the other Um She's mean. She's green. She's a queen. Um, she's come back with a vengeance, and well, War Scrolls kind of suit that, I think. Her her War Scrolls good. She's gone up in points. She still lacks the resilience through some kind of wound ignore model, but her ability to heal has improved. 
Yeah. Um, for sure. You know, you can now do 2d6 wounds allocated. You can heal 2d6 wounds in addition healing d3 wounds to every other model around you. Yeah, so she still has a 30-inch life bloom of d3 heal, but her herself heals 2d6. So I think because that's so good, you may... The problem is she's 700-odd points again. 700-plus points. You can't points. afford to not use it. Okay, 500 <laughs> if you take out a Tree Lord or something like that. Because she does still have that ability, yeah, which is I really know, good. Are. She brings in a unit. So let's talk about what has and hasn't changed. Spear of Kurnoff, 2 and 2. Um, Thank God. It's it's um, gone down from 30 inch range to 24, but it doesn't bracket. Yeah, and more importantly, it does 6 damage it does on a 2 six and 2. Damage, but uh, minus to, 2 damage, but begins to bracket. I know, but... Brilliant. Yeah, minus two. Right. And I th I think this is one of the things that, you know, before we go on, so before people start making their assumptions about the bracketing and whatnot, she sacrifices survivability for regeneration. Yeah. And what that means is with a monster is that more often than not, whilst Teclas with his fiver pig naught may survive three rounds, and so will Alariel. Yeah. She's going to be fighting on her top bracket. Because she's going to keep pumping. Because she's going to keep she's... healing back yeah, up. Yeah, she's going to heal back up to the top bracket, whereas Teclis just slowly, slowly, slowly goes Slowly goes, goes down. She whereas goes down you quicker, could, but bounces back up. You could be up. in turn four, severely damaged, and just bounce your... You could be on uh, four wounds remaining. So you could have taken 11 wounds, say five yeah. wounds remaining. And you heal bottom bracket, like and you could seven just, wounds. Well, you could heal 12. You well, could just, yeah, and you you're could, bouncing but, yeah. straight back to the top bracket yeah. again. And, and I that's, think that's what... And the possibility is yeah that. with her it is quite important because those great antlers are still twos to wound now are really powerful at five damage minus two rounds. but you have to pick your opponent because you anything that can take 16 wounds off without trying too hard against the three up saves yes. you've got to be super careful you don't want to take a yeah. charge from Kragnos. No, instance. you don't want to take a charge for from instance. Kragnos. But she is super maneuverable. 16 inch move and fly. Yeah. And with a new rule, she gets um, retreat and charge. Retreat, shoot, and charge, which is really good. So Another. she can, um, you know, if. Very if difficult you, to pin down. Yeah, very difficult to pin down. And with a model of her size and her power, I think that is really important. So let's, let's just talk about that in practice. You're in combat against something you don't like, it's done a lot of damage to you. You're lucky enough to bang a bunch of wounds back on in your turn, taking yeah. it right up to the bracket. Get out of that combat. Yeah, get out. Get out of that combat. Go across the table. Shoot something quite... Shoot what you've just left behind, maybe. Yeah. And then then go straight into something else that's more favourable to you in terms of the combat. Yeah. That That's what that's about. You know, the, the flittering Definitely. around the Definitely. table. I absolutely love it. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's pretty cool. She's still got the battering ram to do mortal wounds. She's <laughs> still got the M4A to bring on a unit, which, again, is super good. Talon. Strange old rule. We're on the fence on this one. Uh, yes. Um, roll a dice each time a wound inflicted by this model's talent of dwindling is allocated to an enemy model that is not negated. So let's just start by, to get that wound across with the talent of dwindling. It's dwindling, not great. I've got four attacks on threes and fours. Yeah, and this no is it. Rend. No rend, no one damage. So if it had three, rend. four attacks at threes, okay, so we're dropping one uh, or two um, of them. And then four. And then on four, so you're probably like going to get one, one through at no rend. And when you get that through, one through at no rent, you get a one in six chance of slaying. So it's a once per every three game kind of effect. Yeah? Yeah. But she's got other stuff going off. I get that. She's, she's not all stuff. about and the And can you equipment. imagine the satisfaction you're going to have when you charge like Teclas and get it off? <laughs> Can you imagine how happy you're going to be for uh, weeks it's, after? It's, it's ridiculously unlikely. It is could so you remove, unlikely, but it's you going to happen. That way? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. It's going to happen once in your life, <laughs> and it is going to be the sweetest size. It's like Slayer of Kings, you know, without doing it the cheating each way, to actually just get it off <laughs> flat against something important and just remove it. It is. But sweet you know, the game justice. is you, the game is all about reliability, isn't it? 
extremely unreliable ability. But she also has other things. I want to talk about Metamorphosis. Uh, Metamorphosis. Well, great. I think what we should talk about first is that bad boy. <laughs> what, how could um, we miss that? So, still 3-3. Three, 3-3. Three, three. Uh, three, three, three cast, three deny. But she now knows every single spell from the Lore of Deepwood. Finally. Which Marathi has jealousy for because I don't get why they didn't do it for Marathi. I don't get I, I think, you all know, I, I really like how all the gods are getting all their spells. Um, you may see it change. You so may see it change from Marathi. I'm just going to be jealous knows, for Hopefully. Um, either way, I'm super happy it's about really, that. What, but, you know, I think that's really important because, you know, you always took Throne of Vines on her for that plus two to cast. Yeah. And then you cast Metamorphosis. And yeah. then it was like, well, what do I do with the third one? Now you've got so many got options. options for that third spell. Including the heal. You know. Yeah, including regrowth, bringing back models to a unit, bringing back a Colonel Thunder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anything like that. Releasing the swarm of flies. Mm. And Metamorphosis is an extremely powerful spell. So um, it's now... Three up. Uh, suffers one more win. Yeah, roll it? a dice equal to the casting, and again, when you stack things like Throne of Vines on it, it gets really and good. And of course, this is a great thing if you slay the model, uh, one Awaken Wildwood. Let's Holy talk about Only within that. 12 of the slain slay model. model. More it than one be... from other model, terrain feature yeah, or object of just it, one inch. It used to be like on where that unit was yeah. destroyed as well, which often you yeah. didn't get, but now it's only within 12. Okay, next up, Warsong Revenant. We'll cover this briefly because I th I'm conscious of time yeah, on this show. We've it's... been droning on a bit. But the Warsong Revenant, um, Spear of Vines, it's five attacks, threes and threes, minus one, two damage. Blah, seven wounds. Blah, eight with movement. Four, Blah, does it have the fly? It's got the fly. So it jizzes around all over. What's interesting, the four-up ignore. It's pretty... There's a lot going off there. One of the um, only who gives a damn about bravery? Yeah, it's, so we just cross that bit out. It's a disappointment that kind of plus one bravery for Silver Death, minus one for everybody else. I wish it was something like the aura of agony from the Blood Drag Medusa, in which she had an aura of mortal wounds that she gave out. Yeah, and then a battle shock. To me, it's not aura. only just an aura; it's aura for models wholly within twelve inches. Yeah. It uh, should be yeah, yeah. battle shock okay. immunity for Sylvaneth and like some sort of mortal wound or something. So. You know, it just that feels like a much of a nothing. Yeah. Um, the four up ignore is interesting. The it's five really attacks good. doing minus one rent two it's damage. It's good. all right. Um, the roll the dice. The uh, sorry, we've covered the four up. Add on to Add casting, on to casting dispelling, and unbinding. Words. Gets interesting. And um, finally, weird thing again. A two cast wizard. Two cast wizard at yeah, last. He knows all the spells. But this is a weird yeah. one. Knows all the spells again. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't get that. Uh, maybe I love it though. I, I love it. No, I mean, it makes it for it makes it a um, uh, you know like a utilitarian caster. Yes. Quite survivable. Yeah. Um, you know, two spells, so quite useful. Yeah. You need somebody to throw down the Spike Swarm Hive and, yeah. you know, flitter around with a decent move to be able to drop that hive where you need it. Yeah. Um, and then do something else. Um, you know, all of them. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, only thing is, and, you know, oh, and it also has this unleashed, unle uh, unleashed the swarm of spikes, of course, casting value of seven, five up, enemy suffers mortal wound. It's not, it's not great. It's not bad. It's not bad. Because it's actually quite a survivable model with decent combat stats, it's actually but, not a bad spell to have. But, 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 Jack, here's the humdinger. 275. Yeah. Is it 275? 275, mate. Is that what it 275. is? 275. Uh, 275. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's rough. It's rough on us Sylvaneth players who've been waiting for a bit of love. Like, um, uh, uh, 200. What's the Fox spirit character? Okay, it's like 340. I thought it was 300 points. That it might be 300 points. It's 300 points. Oh, I, I might be thinking of the mounting thing, which is yeah. 340. So yeah, the Fox is 300 points. Got, I've got to feel at 275. It's rough. It's rough. Um, it should have been cheaper. 180? 200. I, 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 I would... I, no, I think... 175. Yeah. 20 points. I'll give you 175. 20 points. And I'll throw in the furry dice. Best second. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think 200 points would have been a good sit for... I think 220 maybe at a push, but 275 What, what 275 is, does for oh, you is... Gosh. I'm going to take Deirfru every day over the top of her. Yeah. Um, what what it also does is... I, hell, I'll leave, it even makes Dreitcher look better. Um, yeah. You know that that's the humdinger, but 
You've got Whilst to I'm it a little bit sad about that. Who knows? Maybe it'll be worth it. Maybe it'll be like amazing. Yeah, exactly. With a four up ignore, like teleporting Just around. Just like a very reliable Doing character these... that can keep casting spells, Bombs maybe. But so who knows? Feeling itself back up. It feels like it's a Alariel replacement. You take Alariel or you take her and Durthu. Type yeah, thing. you know, because yeah. she's a really good caster. She's the only good caster that it's true. You it doesn't feel like to. you take those two side by side because there goes a thousand points. You know, no, yeah, you wouldn't yeah. take her and Alaria. But and this is it. This is what we want to talk about Here a little bit for the silver players. This is what I'm excited about. Why amazing. I'm excited because the Wildwood rules have finally changed. They've finally been revised and they've been made something reasonable. Each Awakened Wildwood consists of one to three scenery pieces. So the three trees that we are used of. What that means is... After territories have been determined, determined, you set up Awakened Wildwood terrain features as part of your army, wholly within the territory, more than three inch from all of the terrain features and objectives. If both players can set up terrain features after territories have been set up, you determine So it's something so to know inches, that it has to be wholly within inches. your territory now. Wholly within territory, not six inches, three inches, yeah. blah, 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 all good. Any ability that allows you to add Awakened Wildwood feature will tell you how to set them up. In addition, they must be set up more than three inch from other terrain features and objective. Which is the strangest thing, of course, because the very same ability here, which is in the very same book, says you can do it more than one inch from uh, any other model's terrain features or objectives. So immediately that rule gets countermanded. Here we go again with scenery uh, rules. It's, AOS it's scenery not hard, rules. isn't it? Look, it's, it's not hard. I was writing that. It's only on the page after. Yeah. Um, why not just put three inches? Yeah. I mean, so now the rule would be for this is actually three inch from terrain, uh, three inch from objective, but one inch from enemy models. Yeah, I just... <laughs> Why do I have to do that I mental know, arithmetic? I know. But I'm moving it's, on. I'm moving it's on. Just, just forget about I'm, it. I'm moving on and I'm forgetting about it. Um, because I get into if it has more than one scenery piece, each piece must be set up touching. What? Wait, wait, wait. What? If it has more than one? Yeah. So I can now place a single tree. Yes. Um, I can place two trees. Um, if it has more than one, each piece must be touching the other piece to form a single circle. So I can have two trees forming a circle Yep. in an area of open ground. You can just put one tree down. It is amazing. Uh, if it forms a circle, the inside of the circle becomes part of the terrain feature. Yes. But this is the sweet behebejeebies. I can drop a single tree. And why does that still weak? Because that gives me the sh teleporting shenanigans. One of the main problems with the Sylvaneth Wildwoods was how big they were. You would put the one up at the start of the game, you might be able to get another one up, and that was And it. every battle port report we've done, and we've been open in this in the start of the yes. battle reports, has said, okay, we know we're playing Sylvaneth, we know they're not great, um, we so we're giving space for trees. That you can no more. Stuff. No more we do, do we need to make that adjustment no. because I'm going to be throwing trees up left, right, and centre yeah. and I'm going to be teleporting all over the table and I'm going Wake to be having wild fun. Just everywhere. It's going to be growing out your ears at night. Rechange to the wilderness rule. Visibility between two models is blocked if a straight line of one millimetre is drawn between the closest points of the two models passes across more than three inch of an awakened wildwood. So weirdly enough, one tree could probably still block line of sight on a very, very narrow chance as it passes yeah, through Yeah, but base. if you're kind of going across... But the reality is you're going to need two trees to kind of make it, that difference. It's no longer fly which blocks line of sight. It's now wound characteristics of, of ten. ten or more. And it doesn't block line of sight for Sylvaneth, which is really cool. Yep, yep. Makes sense. Uh, makes well, it means, makes, makes uh, well, Alariel always had the fly keyword anyway, but true. you know, that's true. Um, Kern off hunters with yeah. bows. Yeah, I could that always dust them down, couldn't I? Vengeful forest spirit uh, at the end of each charge phase roll of dice. Um, enemy units within one, blah, blah, blah. Add two, Add two to, to the roll. Wizards are in the spell. So now that starts to become something. It, they've that's... kind of combined the two rules into one, which is yeah. nice. So that's the yeah the kind of awakened wild woody thingy with Bobby that's kind of going off isn't it? Yeah. Which is basically if wizards are around, they're more likely to do damage. And then finally, and I'm just going to talk about it very briefly. Drychers, Spike Grove. It's pretty cool. Here we go. Uh, two Sprite Revenants. Uh, uh, I've just painted two units of Sprite Revenants, so I'm pretty happy because now they get Bring minus one. And this is a problem. I'm taking Drycher. I'm taking Drycher. Am I taking the 275 Four Song Revenant? I suppose yeah. I am instead of Alariel. Maybe Drycher and, and the Revenant makes sense yes. with Dirthu yeah. rather than Alariel makes sense. Yeah. But I think you're right. Once Alariel's on the table, you've got to make some strong 
questions over what goes alongside it. Yeah. Right. Okay. We know we overfocused on that, but that's because of fans army, of the channel so um, like our Sylvanoth army. So yeah. that's what we've done. That's really good. Right. We're going to jump through a few things now because we're consciously yeah. focused on two um, of the key areas. I mean, you know, these are the two Slanashy twins. So this is the Talon of Slanesh. Combat version. Um, four attacks, two threes, minus one, two damage. Two attacks, three threes, minus two, two damage. Um, six attacks at two damage is pretty good. Run and retreat and um, still charge, uh, pretty good. Can't pin it down with a 12-inch move and fly that doesn't bracket. That's really good. It gets stacking abilities to its attack, so every time it fights, it gets plus one attack. So, you know, every turn it's going to be getting better and better and better. Subtract one for hit rolls. Cool. Everybody loves a minus one to hit. Um, and do not take battle shocks. In addition, once per turn, this model can issue a command ability to a friendly Slanesh without a command point being spent. It's good for those clutch moments that uh, your demonettes need to take a battle shock test, but you don't want them all to run, so you spend a command point from her because you've realised that you've spent your last command point like an idiot on something else. It's it's a nice, fast combat creature. Yeah. Um. The the other side of it, so the voice. Which oh, is I was going to skip on actually because oh. I didn't want to cover them both to the same level of detail. Well, at least wow. something is it, don't we? Basically, the other one's a magician. It knows all the spells. It can cast spells, and it can like issue command abilities like super far away. <laughs> Wanted to have a quick look at the witch finders. Um. Uh, the witch killy. These finish. are actually quite cool. cool. I really like they can shoot endless spells. <laughs> she, wow. she shoots an endless she spell shoots. with her crossbow and like dispels it. It's really cool. Um, so, sure shot. I'd want to attack characteristics of this crossbow and I'd want to hit rolls for attacks made for this crossbow if this model has not made a move. Nice stand and shoot. Quite yeah. like that rule. Um, weapons um, and weapons banishment. Of banishment. Yeah, so you get double damage against wizards. So, it's actually a pretty good 24 inch range, two shots. Um, four damage against wizards. It's pretty good at killing wizards um, and demons. You also can um, shoot an endless spell and roll 2d6 to try and dispel it, which is really funny. I just like the idea of shooting endless spells with crossbows now. I think it's a really cool rule that they've implemented. Very, quite a unique rule. He's very similar. What about Galen the dentist? Uh, I am a dentist. He's, I, I know it says dent, but I, I can't. I just see the word dentist. I know. He's, um, he's the same, but he's kind of a combat-oriented one. So he gets retreat and charge um, and six attacks with his broadsword. And again, he can attack um, endless spells. He can stab endless spells if he wants. Why not? What's Why the not? worst that can happen? Um, I really like the idea of just bringing them in. Um, I'm definitely getting them. Oh yeah, and I'm gonna, nice you know, models. I think they're great. Even in like a silver farm, we just bring them in as a little ally detachment. They got the cities of Sigma. Keywords, yeah, brilliant. I really like them. Couple of fun little characters on the table. Yeah. Oh, oh P. P. <laughs> He's really uh, good. Um, croak, croak, the Supreme Lord. Mm, I was going to say not a lot's changed, but quite a lot's changed. Um, they've gone back to kind of the old way they did wounds, so they changed it to him having a four-up ignore. Now they've changed it back to at the end of each phase, it should be noted that this is a phase, so shooting phase and combat phase, they don't carry over. You roll 3d6, you add the number of wounds he's taken. If it gets over 18, he dies. If it doesn't, he heals everything. Um, which was very similar to the old one, but you had like 10 wounds and you had to roll a d6 or something. The main thing to say about Croak is the new model. Yeah, uh, the new, You know, I Croak, XS Max. Yeah. Oh, one um, more thing. He's now add two to casting, dispelling, and unbinding instead of add one because he's the supreme master of order. Makes sense. So, he's really good. Um, he was good before. He's good again now. Like, yeah. Well... A couple of other little things as we went through there, isn't there? There's a, you know, it's a bit of scaven um, stuff. A bit of scaven, some like clans molder mutations, which is yeah, nice if yeah. you run a clans molder army. And, and then a couple of weird little tweaks to a beast lord and a java slave right at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, interesting yeah. stuff. The spurting bile blood. Roll the dice each time a wound inflicted yeah. by a melee weapon is allocated to this model and not the gates on the four. The attacking units yeah. of one. So it's spilling mortal wounds back. You've got like um, reroll. 
this, this gore battle fury, right? You can reroll charge rolls for gore units if they were in reserve from the ambush and they've been set up on the battlefield. That's gore units as in the war scroll gores, which nobody uses. You either go on gores or bestie gores, so that's upsetting. <laughs> if it was gore keyword, yeah, I think yeah. it would be good, but it's not. It kind of would have made the the ambushing kind of and, style. You know, you could argue, oh well, that maybe they meant that, but no, no it's a there, there's a note. yeah, it's a designer's note there that says it only applies to gores, yeah, not the gore keyword. Yeah, pop, pop, pop. just in case but, you were yeah. about to have some fun. Um, Don't yeah. worry, Beast of Chaos players. One day. Let's talk about but some numbers. Today. Let's talk about numbers. We've already covered. Alariel's gone up 740 minus whatever the unit is you're like going to take with her. So Warsong Revenant 275. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Spike Grove 120. Not bad. Not bad. I'd pay that. Um, who, what else do you want to talk about? Kragnos at 760. Um, big lad. I kind of get it. Yeah. About that. Sure, like I haven't played him. I haven't played against him. I can't really. You you know he'll get comment. his points back if you if you utilize him well. Yeah, he's if you play him well, he'll do it. If you play him bad, he won't. If he gets yeah, yeah. like against certain armies, he'll be really good. Against a sentinel spam luminous. This no. energy stuff's interesting. Two eight to two sixty. They're not bad. I mean, well, you know, both of those. Uh, uh, one of them cheaper than the spikes of War Song Revenant. One of them only five points more expensive. Yeah. Um. Wow. Hey, four up ignore. Yeah, well, four up ignore. Uh, the two witch hunters at one one five. I was pleasantly surprised about that. Like, you know, two hundred and thirty points together. Sure, I'll take that. It's not a bad little. Sure. Like I say, it's a great little unit. Um, I think they're a fantastic unit to add to something like fire slayers. Yeah. You go around and shut off a few endless spells, yeah. that kind of stuff. You know, that they're just really interesting Cute. little. No, it's good. You know, utilitarian unit that you can stick into your army, and uh, and I think especially in kind of you know mates games and stuff like that, oh, you yeah. may struggle to kind of say these guys are a, a competitive element, and somebody may break a list out of them that makes sense. Yeah, but I think it'd just be like a nice thing to have on the table. These two little witch finders running around, in particular <coughs> games, you know, if you're up against Zeech or something like that, yeah. and you. A couple of oh, against dudes. Demon, she's horrible. Like, two shots at four damage. Just... Yeah. So there you go. We've uh, we finally got to the end of Kragnos. We haven't covered everything. We've covered a lot. Um, but you appreciate if we go through page by page, then what's the point of you going out and exploring it for yourselves? Um, good book. Good series. Um, goodbye, Age of Sigmar 2. Yeah. I'm kind of sad to see you go. But I couldn't have been happier with the way it happened. Um, I think the these four books have been really good. Um, like I said earlier, the the kind of the artists and the the rule the the law writers, sorry, have done amazing with them. Kind of, I always imagine it's quite hard to write kind of conversations between gods, mm -hmm. but they seem to do it really well in this. Yeah, and uh, they that that definitely They've has been your favorite part, hasn't yeah. it? Right, well, there you go. We hope you've enjoyed the show. I'm going to state it one last time. A huge thank you to the Games Workshop that they faithfully provided us with all four of these books as the series has gone on. Um, and it has been greatly appreciated because it's given us chance to get familiar with this. Um, we are aware, of course, Age of Sigma 3 is just around the corner, which means, you know, this will have elements of these books will have a limited life expectancy. Um but that doesn't they stop you. They have said all the books are going to carry over to AOS 3. Uh, yeah. I, some things are going to change, though. I yeah. mean, there's missions in here and stuff like You're that. You're right. Like the missions some things are going to change and stuff. But the point is that doesn't stop you taking this, repurposing it, and playing the campaign out yeah, in any just version, get to in any version of the game. Um, and we'll be doing that because it's going to be fun to recreate some of this yeah, stuff. I think we've got most of the armies. Boop, boop. <laughs> Right, well, we hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you want to go further than that and support us on Patreon, it would be greatly appreciated because it's because of our patrons all of this is possible, of which we are eternally grateful. Thank you, guys. Um, see you on the other yeah. side. See ya. This video is made possible by our patrons. If you want to know more about how to support us, click on the link to the right.